Okay, well, good evening, brothers and sisters and young people. Uh, the topic tonight, the truth about the Trinity, um, John chapter one is probably one of the, the major chapters in which uh, anybody who believes in the Trinity would go to, first of all, to prove their case. And uh, speaking for myself, quite often we find, find it a challenge to, to, uh, to refute what is being said as we go through uh, the Gospel of John here. So what we hope to do this evening is um, to see what uh, to see what this uh, chapter actually means, rather than go through all the arguments for the Trinity, to look at what is John really saying in these first eighteen verses. And what I find very helpful, and essentially it's the conclusion of the evening, but I think it's helpful if we keep in mind as we go through that what John is talking about is God manifestation and not uh, the idea of being very God, a part of the Trinity, keeping the idea of how God has revealed himself through the flesh, man will help us as we read through these passages. So if we can keep that in mind, um, I, I think it will help us as we go through some of these difficult passages. So as um, was read for us this evening, we see that we're told that in the beginning, now it's, it's natural for our minds to go back to the creation in the beginning. I believe this is intentional for us to think that way. We cannot understand the context of these verses without considering the creation. The Old Testament provides the background to John's gospel. In his creative work, God commanded and it was done. By the word of the Lord, we're told, were the heavens made. And we see that in Psalm 33, verse 6. Uh, obviously, something uh, that's very familiar with each one of us. Psalm 33, verse 6. And the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So essentially, by his word, by his breath. So we see, uh, I jumped, okay, well, we're going to, so we see uh, as we go through the structure of John's uh, prologue here in the first 18 verses, we read in verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now it is suggested that verses 12 to 13 are as a parenthesis a literary feature of this gospel, passing over the parentheses, we read the following. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, the divine purpose unfolded at the beginning is being fulfilled in and the in the manifestation of God in Christ. And we see that this is taken from John Carter uh, on the book, The Gospel of John. So it's, it's very helpful that when we, when we take out those verses, we see a direct connection between verse one of John and verse 14. I think this link is very helpful as we go through. And John is, John Carter is not the only one, uh, only brother who has suggested this parenthesis uh, in their writing. So considering the prologue, we're told in verse two, the same was in the beginning with God. So we have an introduction here in uh, the gospel of John. If we turn there, 
We see John 1, verse 2. Connecting after verse 1, the same was in the beginning with God. So whatever he's talking about was in the beginning with the Father. And then verse 7, we see the same introduction. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. John 1 verse 7, speaking of John the Baptist here. So we see the purpose is stressed in two different and contrasting roles. One was in the beginning, the word. We see that in verse 2. The other one came for a witness, and that was John in verse 7. And as we look at the prologue here, uh, we see that there's three parallel paragraphs. And this is helpful to, to uh, keep in our mind as we go through. So John 1, verses 1 to 5, and I'm not going to read it only because we've just finished reading it. Uh, as an opening passage, but please uh, feel free to have it open in front of you to just um, catch the highlights as we go through. So we see here there's a relationship between the word and the new creation of life in him, which is the light of men. So we see the light of men and the relationship of that to the word. And then Verses 6 to 13, we have a contrast between the true light and John and their respective ministries. And then the, the last paragraph in this group, we have the word. And it reveals his identity as Jesus Christ. So we see how one builds upon another as we go through this section. So the first two paragraphs introduces two different individuals. The third paragraph begins with a conjunction, the word and, which explains what went before. So the final paragraph is explaining what was in the first two paragraphs. So we have the term, the beginning. Both John and Mark start their Gospels with the word beginning. Both omit, omit the birth stories and focus directly on the beginning of the ministry of the Gospel. It's interesting, Luke uh, Mentioned since the time of John, the kingdom is preached. Let's uh, let's turn these up. Let's go to Luke sixteen sixteen. Luke sixteen verse sixteen. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man press it into it. So we see the law and prophets, they were about until we come to John. And then from John onwards, we have the kingdom of God being preached. Acts 1 verse 22. Acts 1 verse 22. Beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day he was taken out from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So we see Luke likewise um, would concur with both uh, John and Mark with having the beginning, not at the birth of Christ, but at the beginning of Christ's baptism. We have... Uh, in Acts 10, verse 36, talking about uh, Christ's baptism. Acts 10, verse 36 to 38. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. 
That word, I say, ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So we see that that is the starting point of the message. So we suggest that the New Testament beginning is the baptism of Christ. So we see that we're told here that the beginning and things which are made. Well, let's just uh, go back to John 1 verses 1 to 3. And let's just uh, refresh our minds by reading that again. John 1 verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So we see that these things echo Genesis 1. But the intention in verses 1 to 3 is to place Jesus as the word in a position parallel to what God says. And God said, let there be light, etc. So it's helpful that we look at it, instead of reading it as this is talking about creation in the, in the very beginning, it's talking about something that is parallel to that creation, and it helps us to understand. The parallel involves doing something by an agent or doing something through someone. The original creation was created by God, the Father, and uh, through or by the angels. The ongoing new creation is being created by God, the Father, by the Word, and through the angels. Christ holds the position of the Word of God, and the angels would be under his feet. So we see as we think about John here and going through, John is talking about a new revelation that a person could be in place of God's spoken word and be the word. When we think of Christ as the word, we think of him as the creative voice, word, or voice of God the Father. And what is created is meant to be a mirror of God. Let's turn to John 12, verse 44. John 12, verses 44 to 46. And Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. So we see here Christ speaking of, of the relationship. It's not about himself. It is about his father that he is revealing. Verses 49 and 50. For I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me. He gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So the words that Christ spoke were not his own. They were of the Father. It was God's word and not his own that he was proclaiming to those round about him. So when we think of a new creation, we have to ask ourselves, well, what was created? So we know that, I don't know if we'll turn off all, up all these passages, but well, Galatians 4 verse 19. Galatians 4, verse 19. Wherefore, 
Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of the transgression. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter three. Galatians four, verse 19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. 1 Peter 1, 23. We see here that we are born by the word. 1 Peter 1, 23. being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Romans 8, verse 29. We see here, of whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Second Corinthians 3.18. And we read there. Second Corinthians 3.18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. You see, Colossians 3 talks about us being renewed in knowledge. As we go through these passages, brethren and sisters, do not they speak of creation? Do they not open our minds to when God originally created man in his image and became uh, God's desire of, of the man to be in the image and likeness of the Father. So we see here a new creation that through Christ, we can be part of that image. So the beginning uh, once again, we have verses that describe the beginning of his ministry. And we're not going to look all these up. Uh, John 6, verse 64. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. John 8, 25. Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. So Christ's words from the beginning. John 15, 27, ye have been with me from the beginning. John 16, verse 4, th these things I said not unto you at the beginning. So we see here the idea of the beginning, the beginning of Christ's ministry, the beginning of the gospel of John is referred to as the beginning. So it's, it's, we want to just stop and look at the logic of how the word is Christ. I haven't worded the title properly there. Okay, so John Carter tells us the thought of the word of God as the expression of his will, effective for its execution, passes easily to the thought of the person who is the manifestation of God, who perfectly did his will, as seen in Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. So the thought, the word of God, this expression of God's will, how it is easily passed down through to the manifestation of God, the one who perfectly did his will. So let's turn to Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. I think it's helpful to just get um, John Carter's views on, on some of these things. So Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, 
and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, if you're anything like me, I, 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 I thought, well, what, what are these verses trying to say? So what I did was I, I went to John Martin's notes on Hebrews. And it says here, the word of God, as we read through to verse 14, we notice the change from the word of God to the personal pronoun his. So here, I believe he is referring back to John chapter 1, verse 14. And we'll just do that quickly. John chapter 1, verse 14. And it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so let's just go on here. In the context of Paul's argument, Christ is the word of God. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 1, verses 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, he hath by himself purged our sins and has sat down at the right hand of God. So in the context of Paul's argument, Christ is the word of God. And indeed, this is one of the titles he bears in the New Testament. We saw that in John 1, 14. And also we see it again in Revelation 19, verse 13. Revelation 19, verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So we see here how uh, a couple of brethren have shown here the logic of Christ being referred to as the Word. We'd like to look at an Old Testament example. Uh, John 1 verse 1, we see here, the word logos was the word to, with that uh, translate towards God or theos. So um, we see here, Lyndall and Scott is telling us the preposition with expresses a direction on the side of in the direction of. So we see here um, gives us the idea of, of someone in between, a, a mediator or uh, one that is towards God. So uh, the word Christ, the idea of mediator, one who expresses God's word, not his own. And we've already seen that versus uh, showing us clearly that Christ didn't come to express his own word, but that of the Father. So let's look at the example in Exodus 4, verses 14 to 16. Exodus 4, verses 14 to 16. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and you will and will teach you what ye shall do 
and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And in the Septuagint, in that last verse says, and so he himself shall speak to the people for you, and he himself will be your mouth. And so you yourself will be to him concerning the things toward God. So we see the idea of, of uh, the uh, typology here of Aaron and Moses, similar to the relation between God and Christ. So we see an Old Testament example of what exactly has taken place in John chapter 1. Aaron speaks to the people. Moses is a God, as God to Aaron. Similarly, uh, to John is a witness, and Christ is the word, that word of God. So once again, we see the idea that Jesus, the word, we may struggle saying this or thinking we are saying that Christ is God. Christ manifested his father. God's word was in him perfectly. And this is something that when we first read and the word was made flesh, and we sort of think, well, there's, there's no good in flesh. And yet, Christ was flesh, and he represented the Father. He manifested his Father perfectly, and I think we, we have to keep that in mind as we go through here. The Word was made flesh, John 1, verse 1. The Word was with, or the idea is towards God. Exodus 19, the Septuagint says, be an advocate for the people concerning the things before or towards God. So we see the idea coming out of someone who is towards God. Hebrews 2, 17, the faithful high priest in things pertaining to or towards God. Hebrews 5, verse 1, ordained of men in things pertaining to or towards God. First John 1, verses 1 to 3, and let's turn that off. First John 1, verses 1 to 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and so show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we see being spoken here, that which was from the beginning, and we suggest that's Christ's baptism. The word of life. Logos is the context of the Old Testament, but here it is referring to the gospel of Christ. The life was manifested through Christ. That eternal life, which was towards the Father, was manifested unto us, God manifestation, the word made flesh. The word of God remains God's word in the mouth of Jesus and the apostles. And of course, a verse we're all very familiar with in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. And we'll just flip over to that. 
never try to do things from memory because um, it just isn't there. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5, verse 19. The wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And that's exactly what we've been going through, haven't we? That, that in this new creation is all about reconciliation. It's all about God in Christ and Christ revealing his father to us. So we see God is the creator of the world. But do we see God carrying out his creative work by or through Jesus, his word? Do we see Jesus involved in the creation of men and women in him? Let's just turn up a couple of passages here. So uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, since we're already in 2 Corinthians and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, or through Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Chapter 4, verse 24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And 1 Peter 1, 23, which we've already read. 1 Peter 1, 23. Twenty-three, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we see how all this language is the language of creation, of changing men and women, and how Christ is involved in this taking place, doing the work of his Father. John 1, verses 3 to 5. We'll just quickly go back there. Not expecting everybody to remember. It'd be nice if we all could, once we read it, that we could remember it. John 1, verses 3 to 5. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the light, and the life was the light of men. And in the light, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So all things were made through him. And it's interesting, the King James will quite well, oh, not always, but quite often we find it translates uh, this word by, but when you go to the Greek, the word is actually through. So 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by or through whom all things, and we through him. So we see here that in God uh, are all things but also through Christ are all things, and we through him. So here we have the idea of all things being through him, being through God, but also through Christ. All things are of the one God, but through the one Lord Jesus. Paul is speaking all things about the new creation because he's speaking of those who are alive in his day. The idea of reconciliation connects people with the concept of all things. So just, just in summary here, uh, the new creation. 
Let's go to Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20, which is very helpful. Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20. It's almost like we could put this parallel to uh, the Gospel of John. Colossians 1, verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by things. By him, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in all things, he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be the things in earth or things in heaven. So we see here that this language is, is, is almost as if it's explaining for us John chapter 1. We see the image of God, the firstborn of every creature. Through him, all things created, thrones, dominions, principles, and power. So through Christ, all things created, all things through him and for him. He is before all things, and through him, all things consist. He is the head of the body, who is the beginning. So Christ is the beginning, he is the head. Through him to reconcile all things. Through him whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So we see here that John chapter one is about the relationship between a father and a son and how the son mirrored his father and manifested his name. And this is so important, brothers and sisters and young people, because it is a lesson for each one of us. It is a lesson that we can apply, that we likewise must do the same. So that we're not dealing with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense of him being God, uh, very God. We, we, can't, we can't relate to that in the same way that we can relate to the Father and relate to the need to manifest his name. Because a person cannot manifest himself. So Christ didn't manifest himself. He manifested his Father. We likewise can't manifest ourselves, we must manifest the Son. Now, we've only just scratched the surface of this subject, and I, um, believe you me. And uh, I, I hope that it's been helpful this evening to just go through some of those highlights. Um, some of the books that I found helpful, I'll just quickly put up on the screen. One book was The Word Became Flesh, a theme in John's Gospel by Graham Jackman. And these are all Christadelphian writers. Um, the other one was Before He Was Born. And this is a book combating the arguments of the pre-existence of Christ by Andrew Perry. And he has a chapter in the book on John 1, verses 1 to 18. And you could by that chapter or that section separately, he has a book on that. And of course, we refer to the Gospel of John by John Carter. Now, 
the one on John 1, verses 1 to 18. Uh, anybody who would like elect an electronic copy of that, uh, drop me an email, and I'll gladly uh, send you a PDF of that book.